Narayanam Namaskitam Narum Chaitanya Rukimam Devam Sarasachim Vyasam Vidogya Vira Nishta Prayashu Bhadresu Nityam Bhagata Sevya Bhagatyatama Shukhi Bhakti Bhavati Naishtiki Nigama Kapurur Garitam Param Shukamukaram Itadu Visam Yitam Vibhata Bhagatam Rasham Aryam Mahora Hora Sikabhuvi Bhavakaham Vishnu Sadam Bhagate Dhamagiri Sahakaru Pranashta Dishamusha Paranako Duno Ditaham Chama Piyata Vishuddha Vishuddham Vibhu Samya Piyarena Viram Varitsiram Parakyahi Duhur Mahadadarmanam Sankhaisana Banamu Santi Nanyataham Anarcha Pashubam Shakshad Bhakti Yogam Lokeshajra Chu Chakri Sattare Samitam Atmanam Ashtamunaya Negrantya Arpitana Parabandya Dekim Manhitam Bhutta Gana Hari Guru Brahma Guru Vishnu Guru Dev Maheshwara Guru Shaksha Parabhada Tashmai Sri Guru Vedama Durgame Patme Andesha Skadapatiya Gareru Sakit Bhaya Sarana Dushantu Sadhu Padambaram Mukham Kavit Pekariyan Shabarishmara Indi Pandrajeva Angadu Deke Tarigani Om Aginati Marandasya Angadana Saka Chaksuru Niritam Yana Tashmai Sri Guru Vedama Sri Chaitanya Marovistam Stapitam Yara Bhutare Sayam Rupa Karamayam Darati Svaparantikam Vandeham Sri Guru Siyatha Parakamaram Sri Guru Vaishnamam Sya Sri Rupam Sagaradam Sahagana Raganatam Vitam Stam Sadevam Sadvaitam Sabarutam Parijana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Vita Sri Vishakan Vitam Stam He Krishna Karuna Sendu Dino Vandu Chagapate Gopisha Gopika Kandada Kantina Mostuti Jayatam Saruto Pango Mamma Medir Vatir Giti Matsavasha Parambhaja Radha Namara Sri Manra Sarasara Vibhamsi Vada Karsan Bhenu Sanupira Gopitata Sriya Sanhan Dibhyad Bindara Nikapadvimada Sri Madhvata Gara Sri Masanishto Sri Sri Radha Shri Dagovanda Prasthada Vihe Seva Manishmana Namo Brahmanya Dabaya Go Brahmanya Ta Jayari Thaya Krishnaya Go Vinaya Namo Nama Mangalam Bhagavan Vishu Mangalam Guru Radhuja Mangalam Parede Kaksho Mangalaya Tano Vidhi Om Naraya Raya Vibhmehi Vasadevaya Dimehi Tano Vishnu Pachodhyate O Mahadevi Chabitmihi Vishnu Padni Chadimihi Tano Lakshmi Pitodiya Tehe Mahalakshmi Namastubhyam Namastubhyam Sare Sare Hari Priya Namastubhyam Namastubhyam Dira Hare Tapta Kanjana Golingi Rari Vindavani Shari Vishavanu Sute Diri Pranamani Hari Priya Shubham Karoti Kaya Namara Gandana Sati Puri Vanasana Deepa Jodhi Namastute Good morning, welcome to Transcendental Tuesday, one and all, Gene, Brent, um, Anyone else who's there on Facebook who has not yet commented, good morning, Sundari Priya as well. We we had a busy day yesterday. You'd think Monday is normally be a slow day, but because a lot of people are off work for the whole week between Christmas and New Year, we were slam. At one point, Bhai Bobby had a Lama tour going on outside by pre-appointment, so I was in the temple. There were so many people there buying things from the gift store, um, eating at the buffet. We had people waiting for tables, literally waiting for tables. And everything, everything was run out. You know, I had to man the gift store, run up the sales, um, clean the tabletops. When one group left, another group came, um, fill up the salad bar, um, uh, heat things up, put them into the steam table trays because they were being wiped out very quickly went through all of our reserves in the fridge um, and then started cooking new things all um, by myself Raleigh and Indu are off Monday Tuesday and Wednesdays my Bobby was unavailable outside during a llama tour the volunteers knock off at one o'clock so it was quite a quite an interesting day when we chant Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Hari Ram, Hari Ram, Ram Ram, Hari Hari. We are praying for service. Well, I think that yesterday my prayers were answered. I mean, it was a wonderful day, really, just full of, and so many nice people. So many nice people. I'm one man. He was. There were three families from Southern California. They served themselves out. They sat down about eight people. So we gave them a big table that has seats eight people, and his son was about to eat. He was about to just dive in, and he said, wait a minute, son, what did I tell you? And he starts chanting from the Bhagavad Gita. 
Not and not not the most well known verses either. Yagya Sista Shinoshanda Munjate Munjate Tedum Gebutanti at Makaranam. Says those who eat food which is not first offered for sacrifice eat only sin. Uh that's not the most famous quoted verse. That's a little known verse of the Bhagavad Gita. So I my ear picked up on it and I started chanting with him and then we went through a whole medley. Then we went into the Shanti Panchikam. Om Shahada Bhaktu, Shahada Bhaktu, Sahaviryam Kavarate Shri, Om Tacham Yaravinam Yagatam Yaga Yagatam Bhakti Yagatam Yaga Pariya Devi Shrasinashti Shrasinam. And we're just smiling, you know, obviously in tune, in sync, in rhythm, on the same page. This is just someone who happened to stop in. They were here on a skiing trip. But one of those wonderfully Pukka South Indian um, persons. It's one of the reasons why I like to go to South India because the culture there is still very much evident and very much preserved. So it was a great day, full of service, full of interesting encounters. Um, yeah, and tomorrow we today, of course, we've got nothing. We've got nothing. And usually we have eight hot things in the um, buffet and right now we have nothing so after this I'm gonna run into the kitchen start cooking preparing for what I think can reasonably be assumed will be another busy day in the service of the Lord so, uh, most likely tomorrow we'll move on to the 34th verse but let's finish up with this verse it's the fourth time we've revisited this iconic verse from the first canto fifth chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam Amiyo Yashabhutanam Jayatin and Tarevamanam Manapananti Chikitsitam. O good soul, Narada speaking to Vyas, does not such a thing apply therapeutically cure a disease which was caused by the very, very same thing? Kapila Dev says to his mother, Devahuti, Pashagamajanam Pashumatmanu Kasaiva Sanam Moksha Dharam Pavitam. Pashagamajanam Pashumatmanu. It is association that causes most of our misery in life. If we associate with people who don't care about their health, who don't care about their marriage, who don't care about their safety, uh, who don't care about others, then it's, it won't be very long before we also start to not care about our marriage, not care about our spouse, not care about our health. That's the result of association. Even uh, a non-devotee like Hiranyakashipu understood this print point. He said, association is like a, it's like a mirror. It will reflect back whatever you put into it. So we are basically the sum total of those with whom we spend most of our time with. And that, that, is, that can be a lodestone. There's enough we have to deal with in this material world on our own, but if we surround ourselves with people who are not going where we are, who are not challenging themselves and who are not inspiring to ourselves to simply live their life with excuses and criticism of others, then it's like putting an anchor around your neck. You're in the ocean as it is. It's all you can do to stay afloat. But once you have a heavy weight in your arms or a heavy weight around your neck or something heavy like a crown on your head, then that's going to take you right to the bottom of the ocean. But we cannot afford the time and the energy that it takes to support dysfunctional people in our life. And we have to get rid of those people who are not going where we're going. Sometimes we're hesitant to do so because we say, well, true, if I get rid of my old friends, I've known them since high school, then I'll be lonely. But the, the problem is that Krishna's not going to bring you new friends until you get rid of the old friends. And when you get rid of the old friends and just be alert, be open, for the new friends that Krishna is going to send you, they're going to be of an altogether higher category. <laughs> and therefore, Kapil says the same thing, which is the cause of being dragged down to the bottom of the material ocean and drowned, so to speak. The same association, it's not that we give up association, but that we transfer association from the undesirable to the desirable. Mahat Sevam Garo Mahar Mukham. Rishab Dev says, it is through good association, wholesome association, 
challenging, inspiring association. Someone said, if you're the smartest person in the room, you need to get some new friends. It's better, actually, you be the dumbest person in the room because then you'll rise to the level of the others. But if you're the smartest person in the room, then you're going to be dragged down to a lower common denominator. It's good to feel that you're in over your head. It's good to feel that you're uh, out of your depth because then you will rise. You will acquire those qualities of those more talented, more creative people around you. And that's very pleasing to God. We take what we have, we sharpen the edge of our axe, so to speak. And the best way to sharpen our talents and abilities is to surround ourselves by people who are further along in that regard than we are. So the very same thing, which is the cause of entanglement in this material world, uh, that association, when it's transformed, can be the cause of our liberation. In the third canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, we quoted this verse yesterday <clears throat> about how God is present everywhere and especially shows variety, differentiation through his energies. Fire is fire. Fire is one. And yet fire exhibits itself in flame. It exhibits itself as sparks. It exhibits itself as smoke. They're all fire. They're all essentially one in quality. And yet at the same time, they're different. There's a difference between the sparks. There's a difference between the spoke. And there's a difference between the flame. And so similarly, the material elements like earth, air, water, fire, ether, they're compared to the smoke. We living entities, parts and parcels of the Lord, are compared to, sp to sparks. It says in the seventh chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Fifth verse. There are five separated energies of the Lord which are categorized under the heading of gross matter. Earth, air, fire, water, ether. So those are the five gross elements and they're compared to the smoke. Now, Krishna says, Above these five elements, there is the spirit soul, part and parcel of God. This material world is animated and pervaded and supported by uncountable living entities, transcendental sparks, eternal uh, parts and parcels of the Lord. And they maintain and support this material nature. And then material nature itself, the overall nature itself, which is called pradhan, or mother nature, if you will. She's like the flaming wood. All of them together, none of them can exist independently. The smoke the sparks and the flames, you'll never see these without being preceded by fire. They are dependent on the fire. They cannot manifest themselves individually. Similarly, the source of everything is one. But he manifests himself at Vaitama Chutam Adadim Anantarupam, that one supreme eternal Lord who essentially has nothing to do with this material nature. He's not subject to the vicissitudes and the changes of material nature. He is always full and complete and separate and remote. At the same time, through the diffusion of his various energies, he exhibits unlimited sorts of varieties. But yet those varieties depend upon the one. They cannot exist independently. The scientists who are lacking God consciousness would have us believe that everything comes from nature. Everything exudes and proceeds from nature. But nature is a byproduct. Nature is the energy of the Lord. When we say nature, we naturally ask, whose nature? We don't see nature as existing separate or independent from a personality. Na nature leads us to think about what preceded that nature. Whose nature? What kind of a nature? So nature itself, cannot act independently. Nature cannot produce life. Nature itself is dull and dead by definition. However, just as a woman cannot independently produce a child, she has to be impregnated by a man. Similarly, nature does not become animated unless until it's activated by the glance of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. 
So you have you have these different elements. You have the original fire, which is compared to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. You have the flame, the sparks, and the spokes. And they're different at the same time. They're all one. So in every one of them, namely in the flames, in the sparks, in the smoke, the integrity of fire is present. And yet all of them are differently situated with different situations. The cosmic manifestation itself is compared to smoke because when smoke passes over the sky, it, it transforms itself. It, it's malleable. It presents many, many different shifting and changing forms in front of us. It's actually fascinating how the smoke shifts and you can imagine all kinds of images in the, in the changing um, demeanor of the smoke. The sparks, again, are compared to the living entities, and the flames to pradana, or material nature. And each and every one of them is manifested, is affected, simply because of having been empowered by the original quality of fire. So therefore, all of these, material nature, the cosmic man, and living entities, they are but God. And essentially, uh, notwithstanding the fact that there's so many different types of varieties, when you boil it down, you come to the bottom line, the essence of it is nothing but God. When we say Hare Krishna, we're referring to Krishna, who is the supreme energetic source. And Hare, during the course of doing a number of tours yesterday, this question came up several times. What is the meaning of Hare? Krishna is not a complete mode of addressing God. Just like you can't think of the sun independently. When you think of the sun, you automatically think of the sunshine. When you think of the sunshine, you automatically think of the sun. God doesn't exist in a vacuum. God does not exist by himself. He exists surrounded and supported by his multifarious potency. So when we say Hare Krishna, Krishna is the energetic source, but Hare are the energies which emanate from the Lord. And our experience is that wherever there's a powerful, influential person, they're never alone. Wherever you see a powerful person, they're surrounded by security people, they're surrounded by media people, they're surrounded by secretaries, they're surrounded by curious bystanders. They're never unnoticed and anonymous when they go from here to there. So similarly, Hare Krishna. Once Someone asked Prabhupada, why do we say back to Godhead? Why don't we just say back to God? Prabhupada explained. Because God himself is a, is a whole concept. Just like you have a ring and you have a diamond. A diamond is the main setting in the ring, but it's also surrounded with all kinds of other smaller stones. That's what brings out the beauty of the diamond. The diamond all by itself is not particularly stunning. But when you have a diamond that's in a beautiful setting, expertly arranged by a craftsman, then that setting enhances and brings out the beauty of the diamond. So Krishna does not want to be thought of or meditated upon alone. His beauty, his qualities, his wealth, his strength is brought out through his devotees. That's why one time Prabhupada said, to drive his point home, Krishna has no name. Krishna personally has no name because we don't want to think of Krishna alone, separate and independent in isolation. Every name of Krishna is a name of Krishna's devotees connected with Krishna. Krishna is never alone. He's always in the association of his devotees. Partha Sarasha, Nanda Nandana, Madhusudana. There are thousands and thousands of names of the Lord. And these names define the Lord in terms of his interpersonal relationships with his devotees. Some of the names of the Lord refer to the fact that he enters into and he illuminates and animates this material nature by which we are surrounded. In the 10th verse of the 9th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Maya Dakshana Prakriti Suyate Sachara Henu Ketu Nanina Jagad Vipari Vartida. Maya Dakshina Prakriti Suyate Sachara Charon. This Maya, this material nature, is one of the energies of the Lord. Material nature is not the source of potencies, not the source of energies, but
but material nature is the byproduct of the Supreme Lord who is called Adyakshena. And when the Lord throws his transcendental glance over the material nature, then and then only can material nature act. Just as only after the father contacts the mother, then and then only is the mother able to conceive a child. Now it may appear to an immature child or a layman that the mother gives birth, gets pregnant, gives birth to the child, independent of any other factor. But those who are experienced know that the father actually is the one without whom the mother cannot give birth to the child. You can say, just to drive the point home, that the father is the one, in fact, who gives birth to the child. Krishna says in the 14th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, fourth, Aham Bija Pidabita Sarva Yonishu Kantiya Mortea Sambhavan Pimat Mortea. This material nature is symptomized by millions and millions of forms. So many different types of forms. Although God is one, separate and independent, nevertheless, as he manifests his energies through material nature, after glancing at material nature, the jivas, millions and millions of jivas, each and every one with their own individual history, their own individual karma, their own individual psychology, they enter into the material nature and then mortea uh, some millions and millions of differentiated forms spring up. So much form, so much variety, in fact, so much potential for distraction that even great saints, demigods, and reasons forget about the original seed from which everything comes. They cannot discern amongst all of that the original seed, which is Sri Krishna, the Supreme Personality of God. There are moving, non-moving manifestations, uh, entities that fly, there are entities that swim, there are entities that run, there are entities that walk, there are entities that don't walk, that don't appear to breathe, that don't speak form the flora and the fauna and the vegetation and the trees and the bushes and the creepers and the roots. And so much is out there. It's it's extremely bewildering. Setting aside, as the material scientists do, the Supreme Father, the Supreme Seed-Giving Father, setting him aside and trying to replace the cause of life with material nature is like trying to get a woman to produce a child independent of a father. It'll never, ever happen. Doesn't matter how much you wish it, how much you hope it, it is phantasmagoria. This is called the logic of Aja, Gala, Shtana, Nyaya. You know what that means? It is the logic of trying to postulate material nature as the cause of the varieties and the millions and millions of myriad life forms is the logic of trying to milk the nipples on the neck of a goat. We've all seen the fleshy little protuberances that hang down from the neck of a goat. And this is a male goat. This is not even a female goat. This is a billy goat. So they look like udders. They look just like the udders of a cow or a female goat. But of course, they're in the wrong place of the body, not where you'd expect them. But if 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 seeing the similarity between the, the, the fleshy things on the neck of a goat and the, and the nipples of a cow or goat, then you try to grab them and you try to get milk from them. You can do it forever. You can do it Till the cows come home, you'll never get a result from it. Oh, just like a woman will never, ever, never in the history of the world has it ever happened, nor is it happening at present, nor will it ever happen in the future that a woman will produce a child independently. Similarly, Yagna Te Chudad Vishpalinga Virachananti and Shmiti had said, never will sparks appear without being preceded. By a large fire. Never will smoke appear without being preceded by a large fire. Never will flames appear unless and until they're preceded by a large fire. 
Therefore, Achahom, Pesho Vasita, all beings are dependent upon me, but I am not dependent upon them. All beings are resting in me, just as small, fiery sparks rest on a large flame, but at the same time, I am not dependent upon them. Asha, Desha, Stitach, Nagnir, in Vishnu Param, it's explained just a little bit further. Jochnir, Vishnu, Parasha, Brahmana, Shakti, Shtetam, Akalajira. Fire is in one place, but the fire is also present and felt at some distance, 20 or 30 yards away, as heat and light. We say the fire feels good. No, the fire would never feel good. If you were, if the fire was actually right at your hands, at your face, you would definitely not be saying the fire feels good. But the fire is over there, and we're experiencing the fire in the form of its energy. So we're experiencing the original one supreme See, giving Father remotely. We're experiencing God at every moment. At every moment, everything is nothing other than the energies, the diffused energies of the Lord. But we're experiencing God in the form of His energies, whereas the process of devotional service, the process of yoga, is to learn how to experience God in terms of the energetic, to go right to the source. And that source is Ishvara Parama Krishna Satyana Anadira Dira Govinda Sarva That seed, that personality who pre existed the sun, the moon, the stars, who existed before Shiva and Brahma, who was the source of the Rishis and the Prajapatis and the great saints and sages, the process of devotional service, serving under the guidance of a bona fide spiritual master is the process of accessing the root cause of everything. You cannot do it by mental speculation. You cannot do it by fruit of work. You cannot do it by yoga. And you cannot do it by austerity. Only by bhakti tu ananya sakya hame vamera gatva drasanja parvesham. Krishna says to Arjuna, only by undivided devotional service can I be known as I am standing before you. On the other hand, if you're misled by the atheistic philosophers who consider the, the jiva, the sparks, and the fire to be the same in all respects, we acknowledge the spark and the fire are the same in some respects, but the spark and the fire are not the same in all respects. They are qualitatively equal, but quantitatively the spark is different from the fire. But the monists, the impersonalists, and essentially atheistic philosophers would have us believe that the spark, the living entity, and the fire are equal in all respects, which is not the case. The fire is much greater than the spark. You may have a little gold earring, and that gold earring is the same in some respects with the gold mine, but there are other respects in which the gold earring is very dramatically and drastically different from the gold mine. It does not have the monetary value of a gold mine for starting. So if one listens to the commentaries, Maya Bhadi Basi Sulahaya Naya, if one listens to the commentaries of those who would equate in all respects the living being with the Supreme Lord, the individual soul with the Supreme Soul, then one loses all real intelligence and is doomed as far as awakening one's relationship with the Supreme Personality of God. The fact is that just as a woman can only deliver a child after being impregnated by the summit of a man, so material nature can supply the material elements. Material nature supplies the elements, but only after being glanced upon by the Supreme Father Mahavishnu can life take place? Can life spring forth in all of its millions and millions of myriad forms? I set aside a story to share with you in this connection. And as soon as I finish this narration, you'll understand what the connection is. It has to do again with this verse, Maya Dakshana Prakriti Suyate Sajra. Krishna is saying that material nature works under my direction. 
material nature is inert. It's the inferior energy of the Lord. But the living beings who are impregnated in material nature through the glance of the Lord, they are actually spiritual nature. They are actually one with the Father. They are sons of the Supreme Lord. And there is a oneness. There's a resonance. There's a potential uh, harmony, synchronicity between the Lord and his sons. So hopefully this story will point us in the right direction. It's the story of um, Dushanta, the story of Shakuntala, and ultimately it's the story of Bharat Maharaj, and it's the story of each and every one of us. Shakuntala, as you may know, was the love child of the sage Vishwamitra and Menak. Vishwamitra had been doing austerities and penances for many years in order to get Brahma Tejas, the power of the Brahmins. And Indra was scared of the competition that um, uh, Vishwamitra represented. Uh, so he sent a heavenly society girl named Manaki to cause Vishwamitra to break his vow of celibacy. Seeing her beautiful, charming form, he discharged Samana. He spent some time with her. And as a result of that union, a child was born of a uh, human named Vishwamitra and a divine Apsara, divine heavenly maiden named Manaki. So she was abandoned by her parents in the wood. Vishwamitra went back to performing austerities. Menaki um, went back to the heavenly planets. And she was left alone in the jungle and adopted by a great sage, Kanda. She grew up uh, in this beautiful, isolated jungle setting. And one day, the king of the world, whose name was Dushanta, happened to pass by. He caught sight of her, fell immediately in love with her. Uh, in those days, the Chachas could get married according to what's called the Gandharva marriage system, which didn't involve any formal vows or any witnesses or anything. So they just sported for some time in the ashram, during which time Shakuntali became pregnant. Dushanta eventually had to go back to take care of affairs at the city, but he said he would return for her. He also said that if I, if I get delayed, uh, you come you come to the city and bring your newborn son with you. And he gave her a ring. He said, present this ring when you come because uh, people people will need to verification that, in fact, you, you are my wife and I don't want it just to depend on my say-so. So this royal ring will be the proof. Vishwanta went back. Now, all Sakunta would th could think of was her husband, her prince charming. She would daydream about him all the time. Now, one day, the great irascible sage named Durvasamuni came to visit. And rather than rushing to give him hospitality, a sitting place, and water, she wasn't so quick off the mark. She was daydreaming and didn't register his presence right away. And he was offended. And so he said that whoever you're thinking of right now, he will forget you. And she she realized the gravity of such a curse and the extremity of it. It was pretty extreme just for a momentary lapse in offering hospitality. So she asked if he'd mitigate the curse, and he said yes. When, when he's presented with some symbol, some manifestation of your relationship, then he'll, he'll, he'll remember you. So time went by. Of course, according to the curse of Devasa, Dasante didn't come back to get her as he'd promised because he'd forgotten her by the effects of the curse. So she decided then to take the ring and take her young son who'd grown up. Now, this is an extraordinary boy. He's, he's a, a, of the Kurus. He's a progenitor. He's an ancestor of the Kurus. Uh, he's the son of the king of the world at that time. He's grown up in the forest. His mother is part mortal, part demigoddess. Um, it is said that his he became so strong and so adept, you know, maybe, you know, this he, precursor of our Tarzan figure, right? that he used to count, he used to wrestle lions and tigers to the ground and open their mouth and count their teeth. <laughs> Don't try this at home. <laughs> so she took this child, wolf child, lion child, tiger child, with her to go 
see the king. It was her husband. They'd forgotten her. She was her intention was to show him the ring. And then according to Devasa's, you know, Devas had mitigated the curse to the point that when she showed the ring, then he would remember. However, when she was crossing a river and she just like childlike, she was fascinated by sort of dragging her hand in the waters. And the ring was, after all, the ring of a man. So the, the force of the current took the ring off of her finger and it sunk underneath the waves. She arrived at the court of Dishmanta. There are a couple of different versions of the story. One is that he didn't remember her and she didn't have the ring. So his memory was not revived. He called her a liar and he sent her packing. Another is that he did remember her, but he wanted verification. He didn't want the citizenry to accept her as his queen just on his say-so. He wanted some independent verification, which was not there. But in the meantime, good news is that a fisherman pulled a fish out of the river, and in the bowels of that fish was this ring. And the fisherman um, brought the ring to Dishmant. And as soon as Dishmant saw the ring, the memories, the recollection came flooding back in. He'd already sent Sukuntala and her son back. And they not only went back to the ashram of Kanva, but she was desolate. She was heartbroken. So she went even deeper into the forest. And her son became even more wild, even more <laughs> uncivilized. So they're, they're living on their own. And you, ha you have really like you have a child who's who's got all the power and potency and instincts of a lion and tiger. So Dishmanta immediately set out. He came to the ashram of Kanva. Kanva said, I don't know, they went deeper into the forest. He himself penetrated the forest deeper. And he didn't initially find Shakuntala, but he, he heard this great commotion, this thrashing in the jungle. And he came and parted and had a look through the, the leaves and the fronds. And he couldn't believe what he saw. A six-year-old boy had a lion pinned to the ground, counting his teeth. <laughs> so this was Bharat Mark. This was Bharat Mark, uh, who who was later, uh, the, you know, the the world, the known world, used to be called uh, Ila Ila Varta Varsha. But he became king of the world. He consolidated all the kingdoms. All the kings paid tribute to him. So the world became known as Bharat Varsha. Bharata Bhumiti Haina Murusha Janma Sharti Parapadat. Says anyone who's born in the land of Bharat Varsha, which basically not only includes India, but the whole known world, uh, has the duty to make their life successful and administer to others as well. So when um, Dushanta, Dushmanta, saw this boy in the jungle, a voice, a celestial voice, came out of the skies. And it said, O oh, king, a son actually belongs to his father. He is the father reborn through the mother. The mother is a sheath. The mother is a container. The mother is like the skin of the bellows through which the father is reborn as the son. And the voice went on to say, Therefore, accept your son here as your own. Do not insult any further Shakuntala. Accept her and honor her as your queen. And this statement coming from the sky resonates with various Vedic injunctions to the effect Atma Vai Putra Namashi, that the father becomes the son. The mother is like a storekeeper. Because the seed of the child, which comes from the father, is placed in her womb. Similarly, material nature is not the cause of life. But material nature keeps, maintains the seed of the supreme father, Krishna, within her womb until such time as the seed springs up in varieties of forms of life. And another point is that it is the father who maintains the son. Once... The son is born and is no longer attached to the umbilical cord of the mother, no longer getting the nourishment through the body of the mother, then it immediately becomes the responsibility of the father uh, in due course of time to supply food. There's a ceremony which is usually performed between the fourth and the sixth month after birth, which is the time that the child begins to be weaned from the breast milk of the mother. It's called 
Adam Prashant. It's the first grain ceremony. There is a big uh, purificatory ceremony. There's canning. The priest is brought in. Special grains in the form of sweet rice and halva, very palatable things. And for the first time, the child is introduced to grains. And from that time on, the father has the responsibility for sharing and ultimately assuming the entire maintenance of the son. This is also confirmed. Eko Bahanam Yobi come on. That one Supreme Lord is supplying all the necessities of life to all of his parts and parcels. He claims each and every one of us as his children, and as a Supreme Father, he accepts the responsibility of maintaining each and every one of us. In the material world, we commonly see that if a man can afford one child, he has one child. If he can afford two childs, he can get two childs. From two to three is a big jump, and you have to get, you can no longer live in an apartment, you need a house with at least three bedrooms, you can no longer drive a sedan, you have to have a mini. So usually people think long and hard before they have the third child, because that means you have to have a lot more income. But if you have that income, and go ahead and have three, have four, have a five. Here in Utah, people have many, many children. It's funny because when the quarantine went in effect, the lockdown went in effect initially at the beginning of COVID, the governor of Utah, Gary Herbert, said there shouldn't be more than 10 people in each house. Shouldn't, you should limit the number of people in each house to 10. And so then many Mormon families had to decide who had to move out because there are often more than 10 blood relatives. Just parents and children often number more than 10. So the joke was they had to decide who had to move out of the house. But the point is that a father will have as many children as he can afford to maintain. Because the Supreme Father has millions and millions and millions of children. And he maintains each and every one of them. The small ant is supplied this little grain of sugar. And the elephant is supplied tons of food. There's an elephant preserve at um, Guru Vaya. They maintain like 60 or 70 elephants. You can visit and you can donate. It takes a lot to supply food to 60 or 70 elephants. The elephants are chained by one leg. And there's a, there's a huge pile of greenery in front of each elephant. And they work their way through that during the course of the day. They have huge molars. Their molars are like this big. And they, you know, they're vegetarian. So they grind and make pulp and chew all day long. It takes up to 500 kgs of greenery to support a single elephant for one day. And yet every living being is supplied food by the seed giving father. And in this connection, Prabhupada says there's no question of overpopulation. To, to talk about overpopulation would infer that Krishna has limited resources. That Krishna can reach a point that he becomes bankrupt. That he reaches a point where the father is no longer able to maintain his children as is his responsibility. Can I tell you that Krishna will never reach that point? The kingdom of God will never, ever go bankrupt. The nature of spirit, the definition of spirit is that there's no limits to the bounteousness. There's no limits. The trees there in the spiritual world can produce unlimited varieties and unlimited quantities of fruit. The cows there can produce countless numbers of milk products. Chintamani Pakara said Meshu Kapa Viksha Laksha Viti Sura Subyava Abhipalya Pinantyam Lakshmi Sahas Sad Brahma Sevimanam Bhopinamari Purusham Tamaham Vidami. You know, we experience scarcity in this material world. Generally we don't care for Vishnu. We don't care for Noan, but we do care for Lakshmi. So many people in India, they'll worship Lakshmi or indirectly in America without putting a face to her. They'll worship Lakshmi, whether they realize it or not, wanting to pry her apart from Vishnu, get the benefits of wealth and prosperity and money in the bank and opulence, and fame and notoriety without worshiping Lakshmi's Lord, the Supreme Narayan. And for some time, they get favor, they get opulence, but it doesn't stay. Lakshmi is called Chancha. Where there is not the worship of her husband, she becomes very restless. 
and she may benedict the family for five or ten years or so, but eventually she'll desert them, leaving them crying, leaving them lamenting for what they gained and then lost again. So this is the experience in the material world. Sometimes we attract Lakshmi to our door, but she's there only momentarily. She comes and then she goes. But in the spiritual world, Lakshmi Sahas said Brahma Savya Mano, the Lord is served by millions and millions of Lakshmis who cannot leave his side even for a moment. So don't worry about God ever running out of resources. Don't worry about God ever defaulting on his responsibility as a supreme parent to supply all the necessities of life to his parts and parcels. Therefore, there is no question of overpopulation. When we experience scarcity, when we suffer for want of food, what is happening is that material nature under the order of the Father withholds her bounteous gifts, withholds wood for shelter and for warming, withholds fruits, withholds grains, withholds lentils because of our position. When we don't give credit to God, when we don't honor him, when we don't perform sacrifice, that's that's the verse that I said I shared with our guest yesterday. Says when one does not eat food which has been first sacrificed to Vishnu, one verily eats only sin. A diseased person has to limit their diet. There are foodstuffs that a diseased person is forbidden to eat. People who have that diseased person's best interest and heart will take all the forbidden food out of the refrigerator. They'll take it out of the reach of that diseased person. That diseased person experiences a scarcity of food because they need to abstain from certain foodstuffs in order to be restored to normal health. So if there's scarcity, if there's talk of overpopulation, it's only because there is no scarcity of resources. There is a scarcity of God consciousness. So if we're, if we're to serve all problems of life and to reconnect ourselves to the source, the energetic seed who is none other than our loving, eternal Father with whom we have a oneness. There is a certain intimacy, there is a certain sweetness between the Father and His Son. A father may have any number of daughters, and that's wonderful. Fathers and daughters love each other. Uh, the father's heart is broken when he has to give away the daughter in marriage. But having said that, there is something special about a father and a son. The Vedic aphorism is that the father is the son. So we, all of us, whether we're in a male or female's bodies, Krishna claims us as his sons, as his parts and parsons. We are one. We are made out of his very same Satchitananda essence. And if we harmonize with him, if we agree to be his good sons, his faithful sons, his loving sons, then we cannot even imagine the intimacy, the love, the relish which is there in terms of our reciprocal relationship with the Supreme Personality of God. Sometimes we're asked, we just had Christmas, just celebrated the birth of Jesus Christ, and he's often described as the only Son of God. When Prabhupada was asked, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the only Son of God? Prabhupada said, why would, why would we limit God in that way? Even an ordinary man has five or six sons. God has unlimited sons. All living beings he claims as his sons. But Jesus was the only good son of God. So let us be the good sons. Let us follow during this Christmas season in the footsteps of the Mahajan, Lord Jesus Christ. Chant the holy names of the Lord. Uh, eat only prasadam, which is offered to him. Follow the instructions of the pure devotee, the spiritual master. Let us all be good sons of the Lord and revive our original eternal relationship with Him. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. This has been Transcendental Tuesday. I'm going to take your leave and get ready to go up into the kitchen and prepare for a whirlwind, another whirlwind day. Life in Spanish Fork is so much fun. This is not Spanish Fork, by the way. 
if you're from out of state, this is the Salt Lake City Temple, which opened in 2019. It does not yet have a buffet, so it's not quite as busy, even though it's in a big metropolitan area. It's not doesn't have quite the traffic that Spanish forecast doesn't keep us quite as busy. But we have hopes for it. We have plans for it in the future. Thank you, Anjali. Hare Krishna. Interesting little image there with the colors coming on top of the head. Bhakti Gary, Hari Ro. Anjali says, we are God. We are, you know, just as the particles of gold are gold, sons of God are God in many respects. Not all respects, but many respects. And we need to claim that. We need to legitimately claim our inheritance, our rights as sons and daughters of the Supreme. Good morning, Sachi. Hare Krishna. Thanks for joining us. Kitchen Seva. Yes, indeed. Kitchen Seva. Panams, Sundari Priya, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Jean, Brent Spencer, thank you all for joining us. We'll be back with the next verse tomorrow, Wisdom Wednesday. Have a great day.